we're going to talk about the role of confinement and exiton exiton annihilation processes. And that's exactly exiton exiton annihilation is modeled by uh, Auger uh, physics. <clears throat> so exiton exiton annihilation is the dominant process by which multi-exciton states decay in, mate in different materials. And what I'm showing here is a figure where on the y-axis I plot on the logarithmic scale the exciton-exciton annihilation coefficient as a function, again as analog scale, of the radiative lifetime for various different materials. <clears throat> we have here two-dimensional structures, three-dimensional quantum dots, nanowires, etc. And the key here uh, of this linear correlation between the exciton exciton annihilation coefficient and the radiative lifetime tau x is described in detail in this paper. And it's not the subject of this work. What I want you to realize from this picture is that exciton exciton annihilation processes, or these that decay mechanism of a multi excitonic state, is present at any material, in any geometry, in any confinement. And so understanding it is central because if we want to get to materials that have very high quantum efficiency and quantum yield, we'd like to control all the decay channels. And if exciton-exciton annihilation is one of the dominant processes, then we need to get a better understanding of how it behaves particularly for confined structures. And why do we want to do it for confined structures? Well, confined structures are very unique in various different ways. First, uh, they can find the excitons. So if we think about this equation that I'm giving up here for an exciton exciton annihilation coefficient in terms of tau x, which is the radiative lifetime, tau auger, which is the auger combination lifetime, and the diffusion of excitons, Diffusion is not a well-defined concept when we talk about confined structures, because when I put an exciton inside a nanoparticle, a quantum dot, it can diffuse anywhere. It's delocalized in the entire material. And so when I load more such excitations onto a very small region in space, then I have to discuss the physics in a very different language, not considering a classical diffusion mechanism, but actually understanding the quantum effects that arise in this lifetime. And the other reason why we want to do it in confined geometries is, of course, they're uh, quite easy to make, and they have diverse properties, and they're very cheap to make, and they're becoming more and more popular in uh, diverse light harvesting applications. And so to understand <coughs> exciton exciton annihilation, the common picture that people use is called Auger model, by which let's consider a situation where we've only generated two uh, electrons and two holes. This would be called the bi-excitonic state. And the Auger process is simply a process by which one of these carriers recombines with its own, one of the electrons recombines with its own and gives the other energy either to an electron, so the other electron is being excited, or in a parallel channel to the hole where the electron preserves its state, the other electron preserves its state, and the hole is being excited. Of course, highly excited holes and highly excited electrons decay very rapidly by producing heat to the band edge of the material. And so this process immediately tells you that you've lost one quanta of excitation, and that would, uh, would reflect itself on the quantum yield. Mathematically, the way we, re uh, we calculate these processes, the rate for these processes, and we assume it's a rate process, is using Fermi's golden rule. Fermi's golden rule is very simple. You have to sum over all final excitonic state, S stands for an excitonic state, starting from an initial bi-excitonic state. And you have to conserve the energy of the initial and final states, the energy of the bi-exciton and the energy of the single exciton has to be conserved. And that's called the Fermi golden rule. And Auger physics is simply an approach to calculate this for these confined structures. Confined because I'm drawing these levels to be discrete rather than continuous, which is what you would obtain in a bulk material that is not confined. 
Now, if we think about the scaling of these uh, processes, then what we find is that this, this scaling of this delta function, in other words, how many files <clears throat> were uh, for the Ogeri combination. And what I was trying to explain is how do this Auger rate scale with the size of the confined structure, size characterized by its volume. And so we know that the final density of electron states, which would enter the golden rule formula here, or the final density of whole states scales with the volume of the particle. The bigger the volume, there are more states available and it's linearly with the volume. Whereas this matrix element that couples the initial biexitonic state to the final single excitonic state, that coupling is the Coulomb coupling, this matrix element squared scales inversely proportional to the volume squared. And so what you would expect from a naive scaling argument that I just gave you is that the Auger life rate would scale inversely proportional to the volume or the Auger lifetime, which is one over the rate, will scale with the volume of the particle, namely bigger particles would show slower Auger. So one way, if you want to think about it, to control the Auger lifetime, which is essential to get high quantum yields, is to go to bigger particles. Of course, this is counterproductive because when we go to the nanoscale, we'd like to confine the particles. So we'd like to have a different control of how to make the Auger lifetime be very long and so that we can collect the light before uh, exciton-exciton annihilation takes place, but without going to bigger particles. Indeed, if you look at the experimental situations, this is an, a, a figure that I took from this uh, nano letter paper. And there's a very nice review given by Klimov in Science 2000 about Auger recombination, where the experimental claim is that, at least for quantum dots, that the Auger lifetime should scale linearly with the volume. And this is called the universal volume scaling of Auger recombination lifetime, lifetimes. And I just gave you an argument, a hand-waving argument, where I've right here, where I've treated these particles as non-interacting. This is two electrons and two holes ending up in one electron hole pair or another electron hole pair that the Auger lifetime should scale with the volume. So are we satisfied with the uh, understanding of what's, gone, what's going on in the experiment? Not quite so, because when you actually do the calculations without making those uh, scaling ana uh, analysis, and unfortunately, the paper that I've adopted this figure from, uh, which is this nano letter 2015, uh, plots the rate as a function of the nanocrystal radius instead of plotting the lifetime as a function of the nanocrystal volume. But the rate and the lifetime are inversely proportional. So instead of going down, this would go up. But what you find is that the rate of this non-interacting picture, this is a theoretical model, actually has two features that are not observed in the experiment. The first one is that it oscillates. It goes up and down, up and down. It doesn't behave monotonically. And this was identified by some resonances in the quantum confined structure. But even if you average over ensemble, you see those oscillations, which do not really occur in the experiment. The other thing which is more troubling is the fact that the scaling of the Auger recombination rate is way steeper than the volume scaling. If it was the volume scaling and A would be the radius of the particle, we would see a scaling of A to the minus three. But we find it, it's much steeper than A to the minus three. And indeed, the canonical results for this non-interacting picture is that the Auger lifetime scales as V to the power of 1.4 to 2.2 in disagreement, complete disagreement with the experimental observation. And so this is one puzzle that we have. We need to still understand, and these are experiments done in 2017, but the universal scaling was done before. So uh, this is still an open problem until uh, 2018, which I will describe quite soon as part of our work. But before we do that, the situation in other quantum confined uh, structures is even more uh, confusing. What I'm showing you here is the Auger combination lifetime as a function of the volume for nano rods. 
And what you see is that uh, while the uh, lead selenite quantum dots follow a universal volume scaling, the rods actually do not. Some of them do. There are particles that do. And some of them actually show a steeper uh, dependence. As a matter of fact, there is a paper even reporting that they do not depend on the nano rod uh, length, but only on its diameter. And so this is a confusing situation experimentally. And then if you think about nanoplatelets, which are the equivalent of these colloidal, two di these are two-dimensional colloidal structures, where you can actually control precisely how many monolayers you have, three, four, five, but you have much less a control about the area of the platelet. So you can control it between 100 and 250 nanometers square. And what they find is that the uh, Auger lifetime depends, if you can call this a fit with two points for three monolayers and five monolayers, they find at least for four monolayers that the Auger lifetime depends on the area of the platelet. But if they look at how it depends on the volume, they find again a violation of the universal volume law. And the question is, uh, is this, um, uh, how, how can we explain these results or how can we account for these results? As a matter of fact, one unique feature that these authors have used to explain the area dependence is what they call diffusion in two dimensions. They assumed that in this nanoplatelet, which has, say, the smallest one is just an area of 10 by 10 nanometers. It's a really tiny structure, and it has only three or four monolayers. And it's atom atomically controlled. It's four monolayers everywhere. It doesn't have a distribution of the number of layers. Um, what they explained is that they generate two excitons that diffuse just like in the ball case. And when they meet, they undergo an exciton exciton annihilation. And the diffusion leads to an aerial law of the Auger lifetime as a function of the area of the platelet. And so, uh, what we set up to do is to actually develop a coherent atomistic approach, coherent meaning quantum mechanical and atomistic approach, atomistic because we want to describe heterostructures, we want to be able to relax stress to uh, account for strain, we'd like to uh, uh, understand heterodimensional structures and very uh, alloys and so forth. And so we want to develop an approach to be able to calculate atomistically the Auger lifetimes in nanostructures with a huge number of atoms for a, from a theoretical atomistic perspective. And then we want to apply these, that approach to experimentally, experimentally relevant confined structures. Uh, when I say experimentally relevant, I don't want to apply it to a tiny structure and infer about the Auger physics from small fuck structures by extrapolating. I want to be able to calculate real nano uh, structures confined to 0D, 1D, and 2D. And finally, we want to uncover the mechanism and the scaling laws of Auger recombination. And so that would be the main subject of my talk. And since it's a theory talk, I'm not going to give too many equations, just the picture that comes out. And if you're interested in more details about uh, the calculations or the methods or the models that we have developed, uh, you can consult the papers or uh, ask me after the talk or, or during the uh, questions. And please feel free to interrupt me whenever needed. And so the first thing that we've noticed is that all the old approaches used what I call a non-interacting formalism by which they describe the initial biexitonic state, two electrons and two holes, as a non-interacting initial bioxytonic state. Now, in the bulk, it might be a good approximation because typically the binding energies of an exciton and the binding energies of a bioxyton are rather small in some of the bulk material. But in confined structures, we know in two-dimensional, these are huge, could be up to an electron volt of a binding energy. And in confined structures, the binding energy increases typically with the radius of the quantum dot. And so ignoring correlations in the initial state may be a wrong uh, assumption when you're trying to describe uh, Auger physics in nanoparticles. However, it's really challenging from a computational theoretical perspective to include such correlations because we're talking about a system that contains tens of thousands of electrons or thousands of electrons. 
And we're talking about describing correlations of a bi-excitonic state, not even a singly excited state. And so what we set up to do is to actually devise a, an approach that includes interactions and, and correlations between electrons and holes, but only the essential correlations. And those in this case would only be the uh, electron hole correlation. So instead of assuming a two electron, two hole, a two hole, and in non-interacting particles, we assume that the initial state, by excitonic state, is made out of two excitonic states in a way. While the final state, since we have excited the particles to higher energies, the final state we can ignore the binding energy of the exciton because it's well above the uh, exciton dissociation energy. And so the final state is considered an electron hole pair and not an interacting pair. We use the beta saltpeter equation approach to describe correlations in, the in this way in the bi-excitonic state. And this amounts to taking an electron and a whole non-correlated picture and mixing them up uh, with higher excited states, both for the electron and for the whole, as well as preserving the, uh, the uh, uh, energy of the initial and final state. That means that we also mix the final state more for the electron or the hole. And we still keep two different channels, a hole channel and an electron channel. In this case, the electron channel is dominant. And all the other details can be found here. And here are the results. So if we take, a, this is the Auger lifetime as a function of the volume of a quantum dot. These are realistic calculations of quantum dots. I'm showing you here a quantum dot with a few, a few thousands of atoms and probably 10,000 of, ele 10, of electrons. And what I'm showing you on the log log plot is the Auger lifetime as a function of the volume of the structure. This is cadmium selenide quantum dots up to about five and a half nanometer in diameter, experimentally relevant regimes. And the red symbols are the non-interacting results. Those are the results of the old theory, not our theory, uh, that does not reproduce the experimental universal volume scaling. It gives us, in this case, a scaling with the volume to the power of 1.7, which signifies the fact that we are missing physics here. And then if we do include those correlations, our interacting formalism, the new formalism, these are the green symbols, we actually get pretty good agreement with a variety of experiments done by Klimov and by uh, Hatun and and other groups uh, through a very wide range of nanoparticle sizes. And we can you know, calculate Auger combination lifetimes for sizes that are experimentally relevant. We don't have to use an extrapolation from low values to high values. And even more impressive, I'd say, besides being able to calculate Auger lifetimes for these very large systems is the fact that we get the magnitude of the lifetime to agree with the experiment. And let me, they say there's no adjustable parameter here. Everything is done from first uh, principles within the models and the approaches that we have developed. And so no adjustable parameter, we get an excellent fit with the experiment. And of course we can go and understand where uh, does the non-interacting formalism fail. And it turns out that if we look at how the density of states in the uh, Auger calculation scales, we find that the density of scales, whether it's interacting or non-interacting, scales pretty much with the volume, which is what you would expect. However, the non-interacting approach uh, overestimates the scaling of the coupling between the initial and final state. And that has to do uh, with the smoothing that, that is going into uh, the beta saltpeter approach that actually gets us the exact uh, V to the uh, inverse V squared scaling that we would expect based on a stationary phase uh, analysis. And so uh, we can move on and ask uh, what happens in, in other systems. Can we use those quantum dots to control the Auger lifetime? And so we were considering as a side project, the Auger combination lifetime in type one, type two core shell quantum dots. This is a typical core shell quantum dot where we have a core of cadmium selenide and a shell, in this particular example, it's cadmium sulfide because those are uh, the ones that were measured recently. And what we find is that, again, the non-interacting formalism doesn't capture the behavior, nor does it capture the magnitude of the Auger combination lifetime, whereas our theoretical approach, interacting formalism, 
the green uh, symbols agree very well with the experimental measure. No fitting parameter here. We have to take into account the relaxation of strain and the existence of, uh, sorry, the relaxation of stress and the existence of, of strain. However, the agreement is really remarkable. And then we can ask ourselves, okay, we can replace the shell and instead of looking at the Ogeri combination lifetime in cadmium sulfide shell, we wanted to look at the Ogeri combination in, in zinc sulfide shell, which would make a transition in this case from what we call a type two band alignment to a type one band alignment. And what you can see is that at least in a type one band alignment where we increase the size of the shell, the number of monolayers, we find that the Ogeri combination lifetimes are independent of that volume. So by using a shell that confines the particles into the core itself and not changing the core, obviously you would expect uh, the Ogeri combination lifetimes not to change, which is what we observed in our calculation. Whereas in a type two behavior, we do see the volume scaling with the size of the shell. And it turns out what I'm showing you on the right are projections of the electron density for cadmium sulfide gel and for cadmium and zinc sulfide gel for the electron in the upper panel and for the hole in the lower panel along one of the axes. And what I want you to pay attention here is that when you have a zinc sulfide gel, both the hole density and the electron density are pretty much confined to the core region, whereas in the type two part, uh, band alignment, uh, the electron, because it's very light, can actually tunnel and reside into the shell quite dramatically, giving rise to this recovery of the volume scaling. So not only that we can recover results for core shells of relevant sizes, but we can also predict how it would behave. And this is, of course, waiting for uh, people to measure and see whether our uh, approaches make any sense. These are all good models to work on because uh, there are good experiments done on these models. And more so, uh, we could calibrate our model and, make, and assess the accuracy of the model. And it turns out that the model does a quite a good job for uh, quantum dots. And the next question we wanted to ask, what's the situation in nano rods? Because there were a few experimental results that suggest that these are these symbols again, Auger lifetime as a function of the volume of the nano rod on a log log scale. And these um, um, vertical lines, uh, blue symbols are experiments that show that the Auger lifetime doesn't depend on the volume. Whereas other experiments which are in blue show that it depends linearly on the volume, volume scaling. And so there's still a, a, a real challenge to understand why some particles behave differently than the others. But what our interacting formalism shows is that at least back then, that for smaller nanorod volumes, we couldn't do the calculations for experimentally relevant sizes at that time. But for smaller nanorod volumes, we see a, a, a volume scaling in nanorods also um, appear to behave uh, universally like quantum dots, not like these experiments, we have to understand that we've made an assumption that this is a coherent mechanism. And for a coherent mechanism, what we're arguing is that the experiments, experimentalists should see the volume scaling for nanorods. Of course, the non-interacting formalism fails and gives us the volume square scaling, but we don't have to calculate things anymore with non-interacting formalism. And so um, if I uh, look at these results, the challenge for us was to be able to extend our methods to describe even larger systems. And we have done this through what I call a stochastic formalism. Because of the lack of time, I'm not going to explain it, just to tell you that we, instead of doing things at scaling O n to the five, we can do things at, cube, uh, at square uh, scaling and square scaling, which makes calculations of bigger systems much more affordable. And indeed, recently, we've applied our approach to understand the scaling of a Jerry combination lifetimes and nanoplatelets. And these are really large systems, very challenging for us to do. Again, 
Previous results by Li and Lian showed a area scaling right here. These are the blue symbols. And they assumed that the diffusion uh, of excitons is the mechanism by which that leads to this aerial scaling. But if you look at the diffusion of excitons in cadmium selenide materials, it's on the order of uh, one centimeter square per second, which would give you a 100 nanometer square per picosecond, which means that the excitons actually, if they diffuse in a picosecond, they should be able to meet in a confined structure to, that is confined to about 100 nanometer square. And uh, so diffusion cannot be the mechanism that it can be used to explain this linear aerial behavior of the Auger lifetime as a function of the nanoplanet area. And so our work does predict a coherent mechanism by which excitons scatter off each other, leading to an aerial dependence in quite good agreement, I'd say. Experiments are quite diverse for these nanoplatelets. These are the black lines that are uh, our current work. And what you can see is that our results follow the black line. We couldn't go to larger systems than 10 square. At that time, we can do it now. And the big question we have right now is whether this is going to flatten or not, because eventually you should reach the bulk limit of a Jerry combination lifetimes by which it shouldn't depend on the volume anymore. One last anecdote that I want to point out, and then I'll be done, is that um, in this paper by Lian, Lian they also described uh, how does the Jerry combination lifetime depends on the thickness. We've done the same calculations and we find almost a linear dependence on the thickness, very different from what they found experimentally, but their data was quite noisy as you've seen before. And so our predictions is that nanoplatelets should also follow the area law, uh, the volume, the universal volume law, uh, including when you change this thickness. And this is still a, an open question that needs to be assessed experimentally. And so to summarize, we've developed the microscopic atomistic theory to describe Augeri combination at the nanoscale. We extended the approach to deal with over 10,000 electrons using the notion of stochastic orbitals, which I didn't cover, but we've done extensive work on using stochastic orbital techniques in various different electronic structure areas and fields. And then we observed the universal volume scaling uh, for the Augeri combination lifetimes whether uh, the system is confined to zero dimension, one dimension, or two dimension nanostructures using the picture that we've developed, which is based on a, co a coherent scattering mechanism ca characterized by lowest order the mini body perturbation technique. And finally, that led to the explanation of the volume scaling in terms of the density of states and the Coulomb coupling and how they scale with the system size. So, with this, I'd like to end and acknowledge. Hagai Eshed, who started working with me on this project, and John Philbin, who was my graduate student, uh, should be Dr. John Philbin now. He's uh, postdocing at Harvard. And I also want to acknowledge my collaborators, Daniel Neuhauser and Marie Baer, uh, for collaborating on um, developing those stochastic techniques. And finally, these are my funding agencies. And thank you for your attention. I'm open for questions.